Hi, thanks for inviting me to Usenix. Um, I'll, talk, I'll explain what I mean by dystopia as a service as we get into this, but um, the three things I'm going to talk about here is um, cloud native. What is a cloud native application? What does that look like? Then I'll talk about the, the basically the, how Netflix runs as a, a global service, the global architecture of Netflix. And I'll end up talking about the components. We now have, I, I can't even keep track, I think we have 35 open source projects on GitHub right now, somewhere in that range, and we're releasing about one a week, major projects. So I'll, talk, I'll try and give it some reason of why are we doing this and what are some of the recent ones that we've come out, come out with. So this is me, just in case you at some point had a book with a red Porsche on the cover. I'm the guy that wrote that you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, some people kind of don't connect the dots anyway. So that was me. Um, and there's a Japanese version of it for any visiting Japanese people. Um, quite all. So what do I mean by cloud native? Well, for this audience particularly, we're, we're generally we're engineers, maybe researchers, but engineering researchers. We're trying to solve hard problems we build these amazing, complicated things, and we fix things when, we break, when they break. That's sort of the uh, daily life of an engineer, trying to figure out the solution to a problem and then fix the thing you built last week that's now falling over, something like that. Um, and we're always trying to build these things perfectly. We want to have perfect code. We want it to run on perfect hardware, and we want it to be perfectly operated. We never push the wrong button and break it. So that's, that's the utopia. That's the goal that we're trying to get to as engineers often. But this perfection takes too long, so we end up compromising. And if you're ever releasing a product, there's always this time to market versus quality. You know, can I, do I have time to take a few more bugs out, or do I have to ship it? Um, and this utopia is always slightly out of reach. You never ever ship a perfect product that was the, exactly what you wanted it to be. It just takes too long. So there's some markets, though, where the time to market is the most important thing. And uh, in particular, if you're making a land grab, uh, Netflix is in the middle of several land grabs. One of them is a global one. We, we just announced we're launching in Holland this fall. We're already in all of Canada, North America, Latin America, all the Nordic countries, and uh, UK and Ireland, right? So we're gradually adding countries. It's an obvious land grab, right? The other one is in exclusive content. We're trying to lock down deals with uh, studios and people making movies and TV shows for exclusive rights to as much content as possible. So, we, for example, we have an exclusive deal with Disney in the US, we have exclusive deals with other companies globally, and we're competing with other people for these exclusive deals. So we're trying to get all the content in all the world, so that's, those are the land grabs. So time to market, getting stuff done quickly, how, quickly do, how long does it take to prepare for a launch in, in Holland or wherever, those, those kinds of things. There's also, uh, if, you're trying, if you're in a competitive situation, you're trying to disrupt those competitors. Um, there's this thing called the OODA loop, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. came out of, um, I think it's Commander Boyd, whatever. It was a, a, a US Air Force guy in the, um, in the Korean War. And in a dogfight, what you wanted to do was get inside your competitors' OODA loop. You wanted to be able to disorient them by doing something they didn't expect. They, they're looking at you, and they're trying to figure out what you're going to do next. But you're looking at them, and you're figuring it out and doing that faster. So when you're in a dogfight, the person who has the fastest time from seeing something to doing something about it will tend to win the dogfight. And this is something you can apply to business, and it's the real reason why business agility and speed matters. And it ends up, it's, if you look at what happened to Blockbuster, it was really that Netflix was iterating so much faster than Blockbuster that we were just disorienting them every step. Every time they tried to do something, we were two steps ahead. We already figured that out. We were building the thing that they weren't expecting next. And then anything delivered as web services, you get the ability to change it continuously. So you have to build, you know, it's not trivial to change it continuously, but you can. If you're shipping something as a DVD that, you know, you have to, Bake, you know, make millions of them, and you can, it takes months to change them, and you have to ship them out, and they're hard to, hard to revise. Those things take months to years to build. But web services, we change it every day. So in these cases, speed is of the essence. Time to market is always going to win. So what do I mean by soon? What I mean is that if you have an idea for something you'd like to build, and you can start building it, and you can have that 
customers using that thing in days. Right? That's, we do that fairly often. We've had a whole projects where we've been iterating on a one cycle, a one week cycle, where every Monday we had a meeting where we looked at the results of the stuff we dreamt up the previous Monday and got out to the customers on Friday and we look at what they did with it over the weekend. We, we ran a, a whole series of uh, personalization algorithm changes on that frequency. Uh, we were running you know, about 20 of these projects in parallel on a run for one week cycle. So that's days instead of months. When we want some hardware, we're in the cloud, it takes minutes. If I want you know, 100 machines in Singapore or, or wherever, Brazil, click a button, 10 minutes later, they're there. That's the, it doesn't matter where they are in the world. It takes a constant time. Um, and up to 100 machines takes roughly constant time as well for us. Yeah, thousands of machines maybe takes an extra five minutes. Um, but we're not talking about going have a meeting with IT to discuss it, and then meeting with finance to figure out whether you can afford it, and meeting with your manager to, and all these, and then meet with the suppliers, and then you know months later your hardware might arrive if you've managed to line all, get all your ducks in a row. We just go, okay, I need something, click done and then I'm probably done with it in a few hours or a few weeks anyway, turn it off again. And if something goes wrong, we want to know that it's gone wrong in seconds. We're, we're, as I'll get to later, we're going to be breaking everything all the time, so we want to know that it's broken really, really quickly. We want to be able to respond to that breakage really, really quickly. So if, I have a, you know, if I'm looking at yesterday's data, it could have been broken for a day. If I'm looking at an hourly summary, you know, there's several hours before I tell something's broken. I want to basically be able to push a button and within a few seconds see, whoops, that was the wrong button, let's turn that back off again, those kinds of things. So you have to have very high, high, low latency and high throughput monitoring of the critical parts of your system. And you have to have automatic responses that take care of stuff in seconds plus the ability of humans to see what's going on and make manual changes in seconds too. So this tips the balance. Instead of working on trying to make our machines cheap, our, our systems cheaper all the time, we don't mind if they're inefficient because, it's hap because we can go faster. We're not trying to make everything better all the time. It's okay if things are slightly broken. Not too broken, but we can deal with some brokenness uh, because we can do it quicker. We don't leave everything static. It's not sitting there for long enough for us to tune it and tweak it and polish it and make it all shiny and nice um, because we're changing it continuously and there is no sense of a version of Netflix or an architecture diagram that you could write. It's changing you know, minute by minute. The, the diagram and the, the, you know, the, the architecture is, is varying completely. But all of this is outbalanced by just being sooner. So this gives us a new engineering challenge, which is we're trying to construct this highly agile and highly available service out of these ephemeral and often broken components. So the cloud services are ephemeral. You turn them off, they go away. You're taking your data with them, if you, you, know, you can just delete things trivially. Uh, and the components, by components here, I don't just mean the, the machines and the networks and whatever in the cloud. I mean the software components we're building, the artifacts we're building from, we're iterating so fast that there is a, quite a lot of brokenness that we're introducing into the system. In fact, most of our outages and most of our broken things come from us breaking it, and a very small proportion actually come from our suppliers breaking it. So I'm going to go through some inspiration, some uh, sort of background reading for, for people. This is an ICE academic conference. Hopefully, some of you have run into this book before. Uh, Michael Nygaard's Release It. It's a, a, he worked for years on trying to get things to work. And this is a, a very clear description of um, sort of case studies of things having gone wrong in trying to release code into production and lots of patterns. And he gives names to the patterns. And some of the patterns we've adopted um, that are quite well known is the bulkhead pattern. You know, think of a ship. You have bulkheads. So you make a hole in one piece of it. The water doesn't spread throughout the whole ship. So you're containing problems to a limited space. So that's the bulkhead pattern. Another one is circuit breakers. So if you overload something, you want to flip the circuit and stop trying to use it. Right? So we, we have that pattern as well in our software. And we have some open source tools that, that, imp that implement both these patterns. So the next one, Thinking in Systems. This book isn't really about computing at all. It's mostly about economics. But it's about thinking about if you set up a, the right systemic behaviors, it, you get an, you know, the right 
system, you get the right emergent behavior. So you don't have to control something. You have to set up the initial conditions correctly, the feedback loops um, and the measurements and the incentives. If you do that right, then the system automatically produces a, a workable environment. And a lot of this discussion was about e the economies and why people always do things wrong and make the economy worse. And you get these boom to bust cycles and oscillations and things like that. But uh, there's a lot of deep thinking here um, that's very applicable to computer systems, particularly large scale ones, which are somewhat, com where, where you're relying on uh, sort of emergent cha chaotic, you know, the complex ad adaptive systems that have emergent behavior that's the behavior you want rather than, you know, doing something bad. So, very, very, it's a fundamental book. Next one, um, Anti-Fragile, this, this book came out last year. And this is sort of, it's kind of an observation people have had for a long time, but you give a, give a name to it and give lots of examples. So th this is just like, you know, say you work out one day, the next day you hurt, right? It's painful, um, but the day after that, you're a bit stronger than you were before, right? That's the whole concept. That's the biological equivalent point of agile, anti-fragile. So you damage something slightly, you exercise it, and it becomes stronger. What that means from our point of view is we deliberately introduce damage and brokenness into our systems to prove that the system as a whole is resilient to that. Uh, this is basically like test to fail. You're doing you know, failure injection testing, fault injection testing. It's the concepts that have been around for a long time. We, we do that in, in our systems by turning machines off, slowing them down, introducing errors, and looking at the way those errors ripple out from that from that source and making sure that it's contained properly by the bulkheads and by the circuit breakers. Right. So you don't know whether your circuit breakers and bulkheads work until something goes wrong. If you wait until something unexpectedly goes wrong, it's usually at an inconvenient time, like you know, a Sunday night or 3 a.m. or whatever. And it's much nicer to do that in a controlled environment um, and in a test environment or in production during the day when everyone's there to see what's going on. We do things like uh, shutting down a third of our entire infrastructure you know, on a Tuesday morning. We've done that recently in production production infrastructure. And we yeah, found a few errors, found a few things that weren't quite stable. But because we run a two out of three quorum kind of voting system, uh, everything keeps working. Yeah, that's called the Chaos Gorilla test, by the way. We have Chaos Monkey takes out one machine. The Chaos Gorilla takes out an entire um, yeah, third of our infrastructure. Uh, another problem you can get into is that uh, if everything's working fine for a long time, people get complacent. And you have this, this problem called drift into failure. Uh, this is a really bad book to be reading on a plane or if you're about to go into hospital. Um, most of the examples consist of planes falling out of the sky, um, people dying in hospital because you know, a, a long sequence of perfectly good, valid decisions were made by people. Nobody was at fault, right? Everything made sense within the, uh, what information was available to somebody. Everyone's making rational decisions. But the cumulative effect of those rational decisions turns into one of these tragedy of the commons kind of problems, where the cumulative effect is that you're drifting closer and closer to a failure, which has never happened. So you know, this, plane, this kind of plane has never fallen out of the sky before. So obviously, they don't do that. So you don't need to maintain them quite as often. And you keep stretching the maintenance intervals until the tailplane falls off. Well, basically, it's what happened to one of them. Um, you know, it stripped a thread, and the rear tailplane trim adjuster died, and the tailplane went like that, and the plane basically nosedived into the ground one day. Uh, because of stretching the maintenance intervals up until they hit a limit, um, but no one had ever hit that limit before, so they thought they could get away with it. They didn't know how much margin they had left. And we've had this problem recently. We had an outage recently where we got, you know, something went wrong, and the team that had this problem weren't ever supposed to be on the critical path. I mean, the last time there was a problem, they just fixed it. It didn't cause any customer visible outage. Some dependencies had crept in, and now it was on the critical path. And some of the fallbacks hadn't been tested, and so some of those broke. And then the engineer that got called in to fix it had never, it was a relatively new engineer, had never been on a call before, had never had to deal with an outage before. So this is the kind of problem that the pilots in the cockpit had on that plane. They had, that what was happening to this plane was completely beyond anything they had ever experienced. Planes just don't do this. And they were totally confused. And this is why you get problem this thinking in systems that when you're confused, you tend to operate something backwards and you do exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. And, and this is another very common problem. That the reaction to a failure is quite often to make it much worse uh, from the operator point of view. Uh, 
So, uh, and then when you do the post-mortem, you discover it's obvious that, that um, you should have done this. Why did you do the opposite? Well, it isn't obvious. Uh, and um, this is a great book. It's more about sociology and psychology of what, is, what does it mean to be obvious and how do you make something obvious so that when people are interacting with systems, the obvious thing to do is actually the right thing to do as opposed to, in, in very many cases, you get confused and you say, oh, it's broken. Let's restart all the machines because that usually fixes it. No, it's actually the, usually the worst thing to do because now you have lots of machines in startup mode and everything craps out and something downstream fails and all those kinds of things. So those kinds of problems. Um, the way we've built our systems, we have lots and lots of little services. Um, we, we have now f something like 400 distinct services, service types. And every one of those, an engineer has gone down, I'm going to write a service that does one thing, single function service. So we can call them microservices, but they are quite fat. I mean, quite often they have a 20 gigabyte Java heap, so they're not really micro in the sense of being small. But they have one interface and they do one thing, right? And if they break, one piece of functionality breaks. And you have to design an API. And when, when people to design APIs just by sort of thinking hard about it and going and doing something, they tend to make lots of mistakes over and over again. So the REST API Design Handbook by George Rees is a compendium of, of, of all of the bad API patterns that he's ever run into and the ones that he thinks works best. And so he's a very opinionated guy. You can follow him on Twitter for like a continuous running stream of ranting about bad API design. Um, he talks about other stuff too. but. Um, he works for, he's the CTO of Instratius, who recently got bought by Dell. They have a software layer that talks to every other cloud vendor ever. Like, I don't know, they have 20 different cloud vendors, most of whom you've never heard of, and most of those ones you've never heard of have truly terrible APIs. <laughs> and, you know, so he's interfaced a, an abstraction layer uh, called Dasein, I mean, the one in German, that's the Dasein cloud, which goes across all of these. Oh, Dasein, anyway. Anyway, so that's lots of great advice. It's a very short book. It's one of these sort of cheap sort of Kindle self-published things, but, but worth, worth getting your APIs well thought through. And finally, um, Joe Weinman has a, you know, Cloudonomics is an extremely detailed book. It's sort of the business models and the operational models behind cloud computing. And uh, you know, for, if you're working more on the business side and you're trying to understand how to do you know, TCO, for data center versus cloud, or you're trying to understand how to use reservations and all the different models behind it. There's lots of mathematics in this book. Um, page 218, I think, has the, uh, the proof that private cloud doesn't work. Yeah, anyway, it's a massive, great long formula, but statistical multiplexing is basically saying if you try and mix lots of workloads together, then you get an averaged out workload which is relatively stable, you know, given enough inputs, right? So this is. Yeah, the law of large numbers and statistics, things average out, and that's why public clouds work, because uh, any one tenant in the cloud is a small proportion of the cloud. The average con capacity of the cloud is pretty stable, but to any individual tenant, it looks infinite. Right? So that's the thing. When you're in your own private cloud, you're always hitting the limit and, and always having to go and have to talk to IT about, I need some more hardware or more disk space. Cloud should be self-service, and it should at least look elastic and look infinite. To, to be productive. And as we said, as I was saying earlier, speed matters. So if you keep hitting your limits and having to go talk to IT, you just lost that speed advantage, which was the whole point anyway. I'll talk a bit about the transitions you go through. We, we had a classic data center-based application. In fact, we still have it. The, the Netflix DVD business still runs on a huge IBM machine, P7 something or other. I forget what it's like a million dollar machine, or we have one or two of them, um, with a million dollar Oracle license on it, <laughs> and a 15 year old schema that no one can now change or touch or even look at funny because it'll break. Um, so the DVD business is now frozen in time, uh, and we're tweaking it gently, trying not to break it because no one really understands how that code works anymore. Everyone's left or doesn't want to get involved. So that's, that's the legacy and that we have something like 9 million customers running on DVD and it's gradually shrinking, right? And they don't want it to change. So we're just treating that as a cash cow right now, taking the profits and investing it in streaming, where we have 36 million customers. We grew by 7 million last year, I think. 
Um, and uh, it's a rapidly growing business. It's very dynamic. That we're adding new features continuously. So, you know, completely the opposite. So in order to switch our developers, we had a pile of developers that were used to writing Oracle SQL and developing jar files, getting those jar files integrated together uh, once every two weeks to make a release. Right? That's kind of sort of agile, but on a two-week train model. A lot of people call that an agile development model. Um, what we did, though, is we gave the developers more freedom and more responsibility. And Netflix culture, we have a culture deck, and there's a whole lot of culture about freedom and responsibility being important. So I'll explain what that means. But what we really did was we decentralized the operations activities, and we automated them as much as possible, and then we made the developers do them. Right? So you run your own system. You're, you are the operator of the code you're writing. And that's the decentralized part. But you're not doing, you know, you're not logging in and handcrafting Linux machines one at a time. We've given you tooling so that it actually doesn't take very much time. And ideally, it takes less time than going and talking to the ops guys used to take. <laughs> right? So if you actually is a net reduction in time and effort to just do it yourself, rather than explaining to somebody else continuously what you're trying to do, and then why didn't you do it right, and why is it still broken, and having all of that extra communication to slow you down. The other thing we did, now we've got the developers and the operations people you know, working as one unit, but you know, mostly the, there were a few, develop, few ops people we had left going to develop code, and the developers operate their own code. So it's not really sticking them together. It's more about a responsibility. But the DevOps organization is actually part of the business organization. We don't have a separate business you know, group that goes all the way up to the top of the company, and then there's an engineering group, and then there's you know, an operations group. We don't have those three silos. We have a business group that's trying to get something done, build streaming, and that group within it has, at fairly low level, groups which build code, own their data sources, operate them directly, and have APIs to the team next to them. Right. So this is the key thing. You have these microservices with APIs. So the guy in the cube next to you, you provide them an API, um, you're not calling out to operations and sharing and, and building this big, you know, glued together system. So that usually means a reorg. So sorry about that. Anybody that's trying to get the cloud native, you sort of end up having to do a reorg if you if you're a traditional enterprise or you're trying to get there from the way people generally do things. So there are four transitions here. The first one I've just mentioned, management. So you're integrating these roles into a single organization. That's a you know, hard thing to do in its own, but you have to kind of figure out that once you've done that, you are then more agile, you can iterate, you can go much faster, you can get things done, you can get your OODA loop inside your competitors because you have an integrated organization and you're not handing off things back and forth. So this becomes a competitive advantage if you can get to it. And if you're working in an organization that can't get to it, you know, if you're an individual contributor, you go find an organization that can. It's probably <laughs> about the best thing. It's actually very hard to get organizations to change. It's actually easier sometimes to, you know, fi figure out which of your competitors is organized in this way and join them, <laughs> um, or start a company which will disrupt everyone else in that industry, which is kind of what, what Netflix has done. We have a very, very tightly integrated organization here, and that's a lot of the speed comes from that. The next thing, and this is probably the hardest thing for developers, um, if you've been used to doing uh, writing SQL, maybe you're you know, Oracle, you're very proud of your Oracle development skills, you're used to doing a top-down approach. You define the schema and then the queries will kind of take care of themselves. That's the, the way that SQL databases are built. All of the schemas are glued together into one big schema, so you can do joins and things, and there's a big database in the back, and somebody operates that, and DBAs operate that, and you just have your tables and you negotiate on changes to the schemas and all these things. So that's kind of the daily life of a developer is trying to get all of their schemas to work together. Uh, when you look at NoSQL, by breaking it apart, we have a fully decentralized data store. So it isn't even in one database anymore. It's a totally separate cluster of machines for each source of data. Um, it's polyglot. You, they don't all have to be the same database. You can have some data in MySQL, some in Cassandra, some in MongoDB. You know, it doesn't matter. But you, you can't then do a join across three totally different systems. There's no kind of real way of doing that. You're always dealing with the API tier. You know, you're, you're talking to a bunch of services over APIs pulling data in. And you have to learn to write 
your, your data access layers backwards. So you, you first of all figure out what are the queries I'm going to need, and then you write, you create these sort of materialized views that support those queries, and they're fully denormalized. So even if within one data store, you may have multiple copies of your data, and it's not even normalized there. You know, some people are very uncomfortable with this to start off with, and they want their transactions, and they want their MVCC, and they want all of these crutches they've been leaning on for the last 10 years. And eventually, you, they realize that this is, this is actually a much simpler world, and you can go faster, and you own everything. And when you change your schema, you don't break everyone else, and you don't have to turn the machine off for 10 minutes to load the new schema. And it's more highly available, and it's much more scalable. And if you've got a large development team, the teams can work independently. But if they break something, they only break their data source. So you don't break everything at once. So this is part of the resilience we get. Um, it's like having 10 fingers. You hurt one finger, I've got nine left, right? It's rather than just trying to do everything with one. Maybe not the best example, but anyway. <laughs> I'll work on that one. Um, so inventing examples on the fly. No, we're good. So the other th next thing we do, we move responsibility from operation to dev for continuous delivery. That means that I own my code, I own my data sources, I know who my dependencies are, you know, who, which other services, which customers depend on me. If I'm not changing one of my you know, SLA contracts with my, the people that, I, that depend on me, I can change anything I want. I can totally change my data schema in my database, I can scale stuff, I can put out new functionality. Um, and then if I'm changing something that affects the people that, that, that depend on me, then I just go and do that on an on a as needed basis. Okay, just talk to these people. I'm changing this stuff. Run this to old and the new version side by side. And actually introducing new things is usually not the problem. The problem comes from retiring the oldest version of something. So you finally go to them, okay, well, I changed this a year ago. You're still running the ancient version of this thing for some service. I just need you to fix, stop needing this ancient version of this library so I can retire it. So instead of the problem being, I have to talk to everybody to start doing something, the problem switches to a much more late binding, much off the, you're, you're, you're not on the critical path if all you're doing is nagging somebody six months or a year later to stop using something, right? So do you see what I mean? You're, you're shifting the, taking, introducing new stuff off the critical path. And we're doing decentralized updates. So you, if you're bringing a brand new service, you update it over and over and over again in a day. Whereas the thing that's been running for months just sits there running and stops, is changing much less frequently. So again, decentralized, the developers are doing it themselves. And then when you want hardware, you know, it's obvious you just go and provision it directly. It takes minutes. So these are the four transitions, you know, getting the management to coordinate everything getting the denormalized data into your, getting a heads around how to build denormalized data stores. There's quite different skill set here, but it's not that hard, it's just unfamiliar. And then moving independently with continuous delivery and uh, cloud deployment, you know, self-service hardware deployment. So what's different here is that we're basically getting out of the way of innovation. We're taking all of the things that, that block you from getting something done out of the way. And there are two sort of cycles you can get into. You know, a lot of traditional companies, they're focused on cost reduction. In fact, a lot of operations groups, their primary focus when you talk to them is cost reduction. They talk to their suppliers who are trying to take, re reduce the cost. But what that tends to do is slow down developers, which makes the company less competitive, which means you have less revenue, then you have lower margins, and then you need to save some more money, and you're in a death spiral. And a lot of large enterprises are stuck in this de death spiral. Well, at Netflix, we focus on process reduction, getting processes sped up, getting processes out of the way of developers. So there is no longer a process for, for you know, applying for hardware. You just go and start it yourself, self-service, for example. That speeds up developers. That makes us more competitive. We get more revenue. We have higher margins, and you know, we don't need to have cost reduction. We've got higher margins, so we can go spend more money on, you know, waste more money on making the developers more productive. And it's more fun, too. <laughs> so we're basically pulling best of breed um, systems. We're doing it by the hour, you know, buying everything by the hour instead of doing three-year deployment, you know, three-year capitalized purchases. We choose what we want to use based on features and whether it scales or not. 
Uh, so the developers are free to pull in pretty much anything they can find on GitHub that's Apache licensed. Um, there's a few kind of rules around licensing, but there's a lot of, that's not a particularly narrow funnel to think about. Um, and almost everything we bring in and is open source, and almost everything we build, we open source. So this is the other thing is knowing all of these different things that are on GitHub and all the, that are out there, Apache license, that are you know, open source tooling, um, knowing your way around those is how developers get to be really fast. Say, oh, I have to collect data from something and do some event stream processing. Okay, uh, that's probably like Kafka and Storm, right? Okay, let's go figure out Kafka. Let's put Storm behind it. Okay, like 50 other startups are doing that. Um, right, I'm now following a pattern. I'm sharing the experiences and the development with all the people at LinkedIn that built Kafka and Twitter that built Storm. And then you're putting Hadoop behind it and all of those kinds of things. So. That, oh, you could go and write it from scratch, or you could spend hours arguing about the exact spec and writing architecture things and you know, having architecture review committee meetings, but you can just go and do this stuff. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the Netflix streaming service that, and how that looks. Hopefully most of you have seen something like this at some point. If you've ever been a Netflix member, you get you know, a row of things. This top 10 list here. This is the thing where we were playing around with algorithms every week for one point. Where it was like, there was just like, pick a, pick a new top 10 algorithm. It's top 10, could be anything. And we had you know, 50 different algorithms, I think, in the end that we threw at that to figure out what happened. Uh, and then I have some Facebook integration showing there too. So how this works is you have a customer device. Uh, it goes to a website, or, or, or it either goes to our website or it's talking to our discovery API if it's a PS3 or an Xbox or something. That pulls up a bunch of user data, personalization algorithms. Uh, you pick something to play, then they're talking to the streaming API. Then, you're t then there's DRM for dispute, uh, digital rights management. And we do a lot of quality service logging and logging where you are in the movie so that if you switch devices or come back to it later, we know how far you've got. So that's what I mean by logging in there. Then we actually deliver the bits from OpenConnect, which is our CDN. Uh, content delivery network, it's not running on AWS. So the, all of the yellowish stuff here is running on AWS, and the red box is actually a box that we build that we ship to ISPs and we install globally um, as close as possible to the customer. This is on the way, way to being the world's biggest CDN. It may already be the world's biggest CDN in terms of uh, bit rate. We're talking many terabits of delivered bandwidth here. Uh, but everything else runs on AWS, and there's no back-end calls into a data center for any other databases. There are some APIs that talk to our DVD business for, for billing, because we have a shared billing system with DVD, but that's basically it. Part of the sign-up flow kind of reaches into the data center. So, hey, we've got a new customer. You might think about charging them next month. And that's, that's basically it. So last November, this is uh, the streaming bandwidth uh, numbers that are kicking around. Um, this is peak period. North America, and fixed access. This means DSL, you know, cable, not mobile. Right? Mobile, is another, there's a different chart for mobile, and it's quite, quite a different mix. And see, Netflix is here with a third of all of the traffic is coming. And this is measured. The, the amount of traffic delivered to customers' homes is one third of all that traffic is Netflix. Right? So we've had to go build our own CDN because all of the other CDNs can't really support this much traffic anymore. Um, so six months later, the total mean bandwidth was up 39%. So in six months, the amount of data being delivered to homes was up 39%. So there are more people getting broadband, there are more people using it, and they're getting higher bandwidth streams too. So that's all stepping up. And happy to say we're still about a third of it. And some of our competitors dropped off the list, so I'm happy about that too. <laughs> I'll let you figure out which one I might be talking about. Um, OK. So what does it really look like? This is actually a fairly simplified version of our dependency flow for our home page. So that page I showed you is this thing here. Um, it calls into maybe 20 different services just to service that one home page, Cache, memcaches and various other services. Those services call other services and call other services. And then you hit a, eventually you hit Cassandra, um, which is a, our data store. Uh, all the green blobs on here are Java apps, and this is monitored with App Dynamics, which uh, captures the transaction flow through JVMs by instrumenting the, the bytecodes. 
And some of them are sort of memcaches, and some of them are S3 buckets and things like that. But primarily, it's back-ended in Cassandra or memcached D for almost everything. So if we lose a service, everything keeps working. You know, if that top 10 service goes down, I can construct a web page that doesn't have a top 10 row on it. I just put something else there. Hey, new releases or something. And you probably won't notice or care. So that's fine. So how are we building this? Let's, let's look at the storage tier. Um, this is highly scalable, available, and durable using open source tool Apache Cassandra. And this is uh, you know, drilling into just one service. So the thing in the middle isn't Cassandra. This is the data access layer service that we built. It provides a REST API. And all the little things on this side are all the consumers of that REST API. This is, one of, this is like a subscriber service. It's one of the most popular ones. So it has whatever that is, 20 or 30 or 40 cl clients calling into it. Right? Everybody needs to look up subscriber information. So they go into this central REST service. Hiding behind that REST service, we have a Cassandra cluster managed using some software called Priam. And if you're not up on Greek mythology, Priam was Cassandra's dad in Greek mythology. And he says whether well, she can go out at night and you can't wear that, you have to be alone by 11. And you have to have backups and you have to, you know, that kind of dad-like thing, right? Fixes stuff. Um, and we have at least six nodes on any one of our clusters. Our biggest clusters right now have 144 nodes, and those are basically capturing data logging kind of traffic. Um, the, I'm not sure how big the, the particular one I'm talking about here, but have we, over, we have over 50 distinct Cassandra clusters. So this pattern is repeated 50 times in our architecture. Okay? Every distinct data source has a data access layer in front of it. Nobody talks directly to Cassandra except the people that own that service, and they build their DAO for it. And they can manage the schemas. They can manage replication. They can manage whatever they want. They can put caches in front or behind it. They provide a, a client library. And if you want to consume data, you import the client library, and you call the client library, and it does whatever it needs to do. In some cases, there's a memcached in front of the client, and sometimes there's a memcached behind the client, uh, depending on how you know, the, the needs of the service, basically. And then the bottom right, you can see there's this optional data center flow. And this is actually part of tra the transition. When you first start, if you've got a traditional application, you build this REST client, and you get everyone to start using it. And you put it in front of your old data center SQL thing, and you build one of them for each materialized view or each table. That, the, that makes sense, right? You abstract just the subscriber data, just the um, you know, movie personalization data, just whatever. So in the backend SQL world, these things are all you know, normalized views of different things, you know, different queries. So you take each commonly used query, you turn it into effectively a sort of materialized view by putting a, a, uh, a REST service in front of it, then you start double writing your data and duplicating it into a NoSQL backend. And you, run, you keep them both in sync for a while. Then eventually, once everything's switched over, you turn off the, the, the SQL, the old SQL backend. And we went through this process it took over a period of about a year or more, where we took a source of truth from being Oracle to being a large number of distinct Cassandra clusters. You know, and yeah, people are going to go, well, how do you keep them all in sync? Well, we have some data checking things. We have some processes running in the background, which are reading from things and making sure everything's kept in sync. And that sort of consistency checker model turns out to work pretty well. Think of it as like a bank. Uh, during the day, banks are doing you know, two-phase commits and all these clever things to make sure your money is OK. At the end of every day, they run a full reconciliation check to make sure that all the money ended up in the right place. So that's why banks shut down every night. Right? That they actually do that um, consistency checking run as well as during the day trying to keep things consistent. All right. And then like each of the icons on here is potentially hundreds or thousands of instances. All right. So each of those services, this is like the one in the middle here. Um, it's a Linux. It's got uh, a big JVM on it. We have Tomcat. We put our code in the Tomcat. But we have a pattern here that it comes pre-built with a whole lot of standard features. So it's got a health check URL. By default, you don't have to do anything. You should probably hook it up so it doesn't just return 200. It sort of does something related to your code to show your code's happy. Um, 
it's got like you should make sure that it doesn't return 200 until you finished initializing and warming up your code in some sense. You have status servlets that give you full introspection into the like the manifest for everything this thing was built out of, um, some monitoring and interfaces, things like that. All that stuff comes for free in a base AMI. So there's a base machine image, and when we do a build, we drop your code into that uh, that your war file into that system, and so everyone's running the same framework. Right? This is the pattern in the platform as a service aspect of this. You've got monitoring built in. There's um, you know, a bunch of other things in there. So almost all our code is delivered as a, a jar file. And it's almost all in uh, Java, but we use quite a bit of Groovy for Groovy Grails apps. And we use quite a bit. We're starting to use Scala. And somebody's talking about using Clojure. Um, so we may actually have some open source stuff in Clojure soon. We've already got some in Scala and quite a bit in Groovy and Java. And then there's Python stuff around the edge. Most of this sort of scripted stuff that's tracking things is, is in Python. Um, the Cassandra instance is a little different. So if you look at that Tomcat server, I'm moving it up to the here. So I've still got my health check, my status. This time the Tomcat server's configured to be quite small. It's running Priam, which I mentioned is our automation for handling Cassandra and managing it. But most of the memory on the machine is taken up by the Cassandra server itself. And the thing I want to emphasize here is we use the local ephemeral disk space. We're not attaching disks to this. We're not attaching SAN disks to it or EBS volumes. That's kind of the traditional way you think about a data store is I have my machine, but I want my disks to be, um, you know, I don't want my, my storage to be ephemeral is the way that most systems are built. Well, we run with ephemeral storage because we have three copies of the data. So I'm mirroring, instead of mirroring within the disk subsystem, we mirror across the machines that are supporting this data store. So every, every time we write data, we write one copy of it to three different machines that are in three different buildings. And it's written initially to memory. And that's good enough, because I'm in three different buildings at this point. Uh, I'm not going to lose three buildings at once. So my, my safety comes from being in geographically dis dispersed buildings, and then the, the that RAM is then written to disk within 10 seconds, and it's written to a single disk in each size. You know, it's in basically, a, we're not doing mirroring at, at that layer either. If a machine breaks for some reason, we throw it away, we start a new one, and Priam says, hey, I'm a replacement machine. It sucks all copies of the data from the other two copies and rebuilds itself, which takes you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Depends how much data there is and how fast the networks are. But it's a matter of minutes to totally replace a node in this system. And we replace them pretty much continuously. We have a 1,000 of these, and we lose you know, a few of them a week, basically, um, just through random failures or because Amazon wants to do maintenance on a rack, and they need to power, you know, take a machine away or retire it or something. So let's talk a bit about the big data side of this. If you're ever doing analytics or DSS, um, that, you know, decision support, one of the things you find is you always have too much data, and you typically run out of disk space fairly often. So what you want to do is have a system that's elastic with disk space. You never have to go and ask for another terabyte of space. Right? You just say, I just write, keep writing the data, and I don't even think about how much data I'm writing. It's always there. I never have to stop and think. Remember, that speeds us up. So now I can store an arbitrary large amount of data. The only thing that's going to be slow is if it's big, it might be slower to read back. So then the question, the thing is, how soon do I want an answer? Right? I have my arbitrary large data set. I want to be able to process it in an arbitrary short period of time. So I want to be able to throw an arbitrary large number of machines at it, because some, most of these algorithms are reasonably scalable. You can sort of, you know, if you throw 100 machines at it, you usually get an answer back in a tenth of the time compared to 10 machines. Yeah, sort of for something like Hadoop, map reduce it's sort of plausibly like that. You can scale up to thousands or tens of thousands of machines. Um, some of the services like Google has a thing called BigQuery, which is basically constant time. If any query you give it will happen. It doesn't matter how big your data set is, you get the answer back in a fraction of a second, because they spread the data more very, very thinly across a very large number of machines. And they have a lot of bandwidth in their system. So to do really agile big data, remember this OODA loop? So the orient and decide parts are that, well, where the big data fits in. You need to be able to make a decision, figure out, you know, extract the data from, you know, extract the information from the data and run enough scenarios and analytics on it to decide what you're going to do next 
before you act. And the faster you can do that, the faster your OODA loop. So you don't want to be waiting for disk space and waiting for a, a, an, analy an analytics job to, wait, to run. So this is why this is a natural for the cloud. It's a very elastic thing. You want to be able to just fire up a 1,000 machines for a couple of hours and then give them back again. So we built a thing called Data Oven. The Hadoop Summit, I think, is this week somewhere else in the valley. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Where is it? You're not allowed to all run off to that one, right? Oh. OK, all right. You're going to stay here, though. This is much more my conference. Um, so we, we've been, we have a bunch of people going there. And we've open sourced some things for this. And one of the things we have is data oven. So we have the data coming in. So we have event streams. 100 billion events a day is the rate we run at. Uh, an event would be somebody clicked on a link, somebody you know got this far in a movie, those kinds of things. So it's a person and a customer ID and some action that they took. right? And then we have the dimension data, which is the full set of customer IDs. Because if just having the customer ID doesn't help unless I know what is the set of customer IDs, what is the set of movie IDs. This is the dimension data. We pull that in directly from Cassandra. That's what C, C stars are, yeah, abbreviation for Cassandra. Agisthus was the person that killed Cassandra. This works off a dead Cassandra cluster. It reads the backup files. Um, so we have unpronounceable names as a service. Um, I'm not sure even why that one's called Ursula. So then we store that data in S3. And S3 is just, you know, you never run out of space in S3. I don't think Amazon has ever run out of space. You just keep writing to it. So our, our data warehouse is S3. We store two petabytes in it. It's growing like as fast as we need it to grow. We then process that raw data using Hadoop clusters, which are managed using a thing called Genie, which we open sourced last Friday. It's a REST interface for abstracting. I want to run a Hadoop job from, uh, I don't care which cluster it runs on. I don't care what, you know, my data is somewhere over here. My data is somewhere in S3. I just want to run this job. And you don't have, there's no client library for it. You can basically just submit your job. So think of it as sort of a job, so it's an abstraction of, of the collection of Hadoop clusters we have. So it'll take the job, it'll find a space to run it, and if there isn't enough space, it'll start a whole new cluster to make that space. So we have this 1,300 node cluster that's doing all of the regularly scheduled processing. We use a, job, a workflow scheduler called UC4, which is basically processing everything. And it, one of the things it does is call Genie to fire up it works jobs to clean up the data and all of the stuff you're doing continuously. Then the analysts that are generally running stuff during the day on a more ad hoc basis use the middle cluster that's 800 nodes. And we keep growing that one. And, and, and if, we, if somebody wants to run an extra big analysis, they'll kick off a new cluster dynamically. And then we have a few that do the daily roll up. They run it just after midnight every day. And they calculate the yesterday view of the world for all of those kinds of metrics. And we use a, a multiple 150 node clusters to do that. These ones we get for free because the machines that are running it used to be API servers at peak. So we have a reservation on a, on a particular type of instance in AWS. And through peak, they're API servers. And off peak, they get returned to AWS. And we grab them again to be Hadoop clusters at night. So they're not physically the same machines, but they might be. But it's, it's going against the same reservation that we have with AWS. So we needed them at peak for API. And we get, we're basically mopping up spare capacity overnight. Uh, we also have a, another tool coming out, possibly today or tomorrow, um, which is a visualization tool uh, for the pig language. And it's called Lipstick, because somebody had to go there. <laughs> um, I'm not sure quite when it's out, but I think it's this week. Um, and so we do a lot of tooling, right? We use EMR. That's the Amazon, please make me a Hadoop cluster that's this big. And it, 10 minutes later, the Hadoop cluster's there. That's the way we do Hadoop. And we don't go and hand install Hadoop at all. So let me see. I'll talk a bit about sort of the global architecture, and then briefly talk about the open source uh, things at the end here. So our client library for Cassandra is interesting. It's a thing we built. Astonax is, let me think. Uh, I think Hector was Cassandra's brother, and this is his son. And Hector was the previous Java library that we didn't like, so we made the son of Hector. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sorry about this. But th there's a few things it has in it that are, that are quite nice. Um, but it's a very efficient library. But the most important thing we have, this is probably one of the most commonly used um, 
tools that we have. Pretty much anyone that's doing Java uh, to Cassandra is using Astanax um, and trying to pronounce it and spending it A6X because it's easier. So we have a bunch of recipes, and this is what happens when you have a large developer team. They keep you know, making the same mistake over and over again. You say, okay, we figured out how to do a distributed row lock. Let's write th that as a recipe. So the next person that comes along says, okay, there's the code. Just use it. And we've published these recipes on, on our GitHub. Things like uh, chunked and multi-threaded large file storage. You can, if you try storing a gigabyte-sized object into a, as a single object, a blob, into a database, it typically blows up when you try and read it because it runs out of memory. Okay, oh, whatever. Um, and um, what you have to do is multi break it into chunks, multi-thread and retile the chunks to make sure everything got there. And the same thing when you're reading back, you have to multi-thread the read back. That means you get constant time reads, very efficient. And it also spreads the data across the cluster rather than putting everything on one node and blowing up that node trying to read the data back. So things like that. A durable message queue. There's a bunch of anti-patterns about building message queues when you have a, um, a uh, immutable store because you have to end up with too many tombstones in it, things like that. And we're getting contributions from outside. So we have the Netflix OSS and we have a cloud prize and somebody built a high cardinality reverse index recipe and contributed it back. So anyone playing in this space, if you build any recipes, give them back and you might win a prize. I'll talk about that a bit later. So we have two use cases for cross-region. This is one of the big features of Cassandra that it does very well. We're doing geographic isolation between the US and Europe and we're working right now on redundancy for regional failover between US East and US West. So I'll talk about what that looks like. So since we decided we want to take our write intensive data stores and copy the data from east to west, we should benchmark that. So we're cloud, right? So let's make 96 node Cassandra cluster for, for a benchmark, which was done off a hallway conversation and we built it that afternoon, right? <laughs> this isn't something, you know. Go to your IT guys and say, I need 200 terabytes of SSD in six buildings, please. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't take 10 minutes but it does when you do it in cloud. Um, so we fired it up. We then restored 18 terabytes of data, our current data set from our production backups into one of the clusters. Next thing we did was push that data across country to the other side. That happened to run at nine gigabits. I was quite disappointed. The system has 480 gigabits of bisectional bandwidth across the country. I wanted to break the internet and it didn't break because it's single threaded and there's only 48 nodes copying it. And I was disappointed that it only went at nine gig. Um, but I, you know, other people were surprised it went at nine gig, so that was all right. They're working on multi-threading that operation, so we really will be able to break things. Um, and it turns out 83 milliseconds very stably is the latency between uh, Virginia and Oregon. So it turns out as that's the TCP round trip latency measurement, not at that level, the TCP layer. So then we put a test load on either side. That causes interzone traffic and interregion traffic. And we drove it to a level that was several times our current traffic level. That all worked. Um, and then we put a validation load where we wrote a million things in uh, on one side and read them back from the other side to make sure they got there. And we read it back about half a second after we wrote it. And they all got there within half a second. So it's eventually consistent within half a second, which seems plausible um, for Generally, customers won't notice stuff being out of sync by half a second if they happen to hit one side and the other. So that's, this was a test. Um, we ran this system for a week or so, trying different things, breaking it different ways, you know, running different kinds of things against it, and then we turned it off again. Um, and that's, that, this is what I really like about benchmarking. You can do infrastructure benchmarking in the cloud that you couldn't think about doing previously. Just too, too much work. So given I've got this system, I've got it in production, and we're working on put it in, putting it in production. We have a customer. Uh, the customer needs to be routed to the end systems, and we use DNS to get there. And we're using three different suppliers because each of them does slightly different things. Uh, but what we want to be able to do is split, the, split America, say, down the Mississippi or somewhere, which is 50% traffic each side, and stably have customers glued to one side or the other based on what state they're in. Yeah. Your state as in US state, <laughs> um, zip code kind of thing. Um, so we wrap that with a piece of open source software called Denominator, which is a Java client library for doing anything you want to do with DNS. Uh, the latest version of this this week is uh, built as an Android app. I mean, you can actually have an Android app where you could swipe a machine, you know, an entire DNS environment across country with a flip of your finger. Um, so 
looking for that as a contributed piece of software. Break your system with a flick. Um, but it's a very powerful abstraction layer around a bunch of quite broken APIs. Route 53 is missing too many features, and Ultra and Dyn have been turned out to be quite broken, and we've been debugging them. So now if I lose a, re a zone, I've got three copies in each zone of all my data, uh, in each region of all my data. If I lose one entire data center, everything still works. There's not even any customer impact, maybe a few retries, uh, a few, you know, slightly slow for 30 seconds, something like that. If I lose an entire region, what I want to do is switch all my traffic to the other region. If I lose a load balancer or the entire, you know, or anything in, in that uh, network path to, this, to the region, again, I switch everything to the other region with DNS. And if I lose a DNS supplier, I can switch to another DNS supplier because I'm actually storing my entire DNS configuration outside of the suppliers in an abstract uh, layer that denominator uses that I can you know, go to another region and reapply it somewhere else. So this is part of our traffic routing. We're working on getting this out. We're, this is kind of most of this year, step by step, we've been working on this. So just briefly talking, I'm starting to run out of time, but let's say we have incidents. You know, we have a few incidents a year that you, people hear about, called public relations incidents. They're big enough that they get to, you know, they make it into the press. Uh, and then there's you know, maybe 10 times as many incidents where they didn't make it into the press, but people called customer service, right? So those are the ones where you know, customers annoyed, those ones have a material impact on retention. Customers tend to leave if they get too, have to call CS too many times. There's another layer where customers didn't even notice, but they got a reduced, uh, they got less personalized experience. And if you don't track those carefully, it actually messes up your impacts. So we're doing A-B testing of different features, and if we fail back and we don't give you the feature, but we didn't notice we didn't give you the feature, it was because we broke, we give you the wrong feature set. Um, when we do the analysis of who does what because of the features, it tends to pollute the data. And then what we really want to be is, you know, most of the incidents are completely hidden. They don't affect anything. The system just absorbs it, retries, continues. So that's kind of the um, sort of the sort of tree of these things, and it's sort of an order of magnitude bigger in each layer. So what we want, what we're working on, is this active-active rollout. We're trying to take a chunk of those big incidents, the PR incidents. Um, by game day practicing and active active failover, re take a chunk of those and move those down to just be people calling CS for a while, but we didn't make it all the way into a big PR impact. Then we want to have better tools and practices for the sort of the slightly smaller ones that people call CS about and make them be invisible. And we want to take all of the instrumentation metrics pollution ones and by better tagging of the data so that we know when there's something gone wrong and affected this customer and all these kinds of things, making sure our data flow is clean means that we actually end up with clean data in the back end. And the, these, cust these ones that have metric impacts but customers don't see, this is the level we want to be doing all our testing at. We want to have cloud, you know, the, the, the anti-fragile testing, we want it to not cause customer visible impact, but also not pollute our data. But we want to be able to drive errors into the system to figure it out. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about the cloud prize. This is all netflix.github.com. We have uh, 10 categories. Each of these wins a prize. A judge's choice award is for anything that didn't fit another category. Um, best new monkey, best feature, best data store. Yeah, anybody, just QA people, you can get a prize. User interface people, you can win a prize. Um, and then operations, performance tools people, you can win a prize too. So it's not just for code development against you know, core distributed systems algorithms. We're looking at the whole spread of things that contribute. These are the six judges. Um, Yuri's my manager. He's funding most of this. Um, Werner Vogels is also putting up some prizes. Joe Wyman, I mentioned, is the author of the Cloudnomics book. Now, Aino Curry, anybody, she's an academic in Denmark and a program chair for QCon GoTo conferences. Simon Wardley is a, a strategist for open source. Um, and Martin Thaler was on the Agile Manifesto, one of the guys, you know, fundamental guy in this space. So they're going to decide um, who did the best out of all the entrants, and they're going to decide in September. So you've got until September the 15th to do something. Um, and what do you win? We've got one winner. You get a ticket and expenses to go to AWS reInvent in Las Vegas uh, to spend all your prize money on the tables. Um, and that's in November. 
So we're closing the, conf the, the contest in September, and then we'll announce the winners in October so that you have time to go to Vegas. A trophy, which would be a cool trophy, and it would be a it's kind of kind of cloud monkey, and it's kind of beep, got flashing lights on it and things. So it's not just a boring trophy. It's a very geeky trophy. Uh, and then ten thousand dollars in cash and five thousand in AWS credits for each winner in this, which is, you know, if you're a student, it's maybe a good amount of money. It's kind of a, like a month salary in the Bay Area or something like that. But it's a uh, it's a reasonable amount. Hopefully, it's enough to get people to do things. But um, you get also, you know, massive fame, and you know, the, if you're really good, maybe we'll hire you, but not until after you finish the prize, because and people that work for Netflix aren't eligible for the prize. That's the problem. So let's just quickly look at what we've got on Netflix OSS, and then I'll wrap up. So what, what we've been doing here is that a few years ago we started doing this, and we were bleeding edge. We were making stuff up. We were reading the fundamental papers that Google wrote and the papers Amazon wrote, and trying to work this out from first, first principles because no one else had really done this stuff. Then we started, we got it kind of working. We went out and started doing talks at conferences, you know, around about 2011. And people saying, oh, that's interesting, or what about this? So we started validating in, in public. And, we, and us and other companies doing similar things start building up common patterns for the way we were looking at this. And then what we're doing this year and, and next year is making this into a shared pattern, like releasing the code so it's trivial to just go launch you know, a Netflix OSS cloud-native thing. You can just start putting your application in it. You don't have to build the platform as well. Right. And platform as a service is coming up. There are many different varieties of it. This is think of what we've got as a as a platform as a service offering aimed at large scale enterprise global workloads that that are with hundreds of developers working on them. That's really our sweet spot. We, there's a bunch of things you do differently at that scale if you're running on thousands to ten, tens of thousands of machines that you wouldn't be doing if you're like a two person startup. We're probably overly complex and there's too many moving parts for, for, for a really small startup. But there's quite often, there's a lot of people in the enterprise space trying to figure out how to get into the cloud space that are now paying a lot of attention to this. Okay, so this is the goals. Get these established as best practices, try out the ideas in public, figure out what works. Hire, retain, engage top engineers, that's been working well for us. Um, build up a brand. It's now effectively impossible to do a talk about cloud without mentioning Netflix at some point. So that seems to be working. And then get this shared ecosystem of contributions going. So it all fits together. We have an example application. Each uh, You see some of these names like Aston X here. I won't go into this in detail, but we have a, like a sample application for a front-end app and a sample application for a middle-tier app. Um, and when we do boot camp training at work at Netflix, we kind of get the people in the room to figure out how to launch these apps, and then you use one or the other as a starting point for your own code. Uh, one of the things released, we released since we did this example app is a, a, a traffic processing and routing layer called Zool. That's the, the gatekeeper from, um, what's the movie? Damn it. Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, yeah. My brain keeps fading on that one. Um, and this is kind of what it does. This is a, an example of a fairly sophisticated application that we've built. So you have an input request. It's got a series of filters, groovy, functional groovy filters. You can use other things, but typically we use functional groovy filters that do input processing, routing, and then on the return path, they do the output processing and sticking the right headers on and all those kinds of things. You can do OAuth with this. You can basically use this as a front end to an API to manage and route the traffic and massage the traffic into an API. We're putting this, we started this with our, our general device API service, but we're moving it across everything. We're gonna be accessing our website through this. Uh, in fact, we are already accessing our website through this. These little groovy filters, dynamically updatable in seconds. You write a new one, you drop it into Cassandra, it goes through the publisher thing, it pops up, and it dynamically loads into this, into this Zool system that's continuously running. So you can continually reprogram all of the information. You can say tap into this. If there's something you want to look at, like a surgical, I just want to see what this particular machine is doing, you can actually tap out any information you want from it. It's a very powerful system. We also have a usage tracking system. Uh, this is a, announced this last week, I think. It's, uh, it's basically tra tracking all the spend and slicing and dicing and making sure, you're not, you know, making sure you have reservations in the right places. 
So there's a build system. You know, everything's on GitHub, but we're working through it. We're still working on getting some base AMIs out. This is one of the missing links. So the stuff that's a bit sort of faded looking here are things we haven't done yet. Asgard's the main console we use. So this delivers into an account. And then within an account, we have all these services that, uh, that we've already got deployed. So we have the console, configuration service, Cassandra, a dashboard building system. We have our monitoring system's not out yet. Genie and Lipstick, I mentioned, usage monitoring, and then service registry, zookeeper libraries, a history service, uh, the simian army is all the monkeys, uh, the traffic manager, and then within each application, we've got some memcached and Cassandra related things. And then when you're building your application, there's a whole load of more, this is, all the open, this is kind of the decoder ring for all of those stupid names we keep coming up with. ICE is at least easy to spell and remember. Um, but we have you know, initialization. This is sort of the library level stuff as opposed to the service level stuff. But this is all of these things are projects. And I haven't even got all of the projects on here. There's a few more as well. I'm running out of time. But just briefly, what's coming next? We're making this more portable. So right now, it's uh, AWS specific in some cases, or Cassandra specific, if, if you want to use it you know, independently. Um, we're working on this high availability failover, making it easier to deploy, and getting contributions from people. Um, Eucalyptus uh, have a production version of running now that runs a substantial amount of this toolkit. So if you want to run it in your own data center and you happen to be using Eucalyptus, you can just load the latest version of Eucalyptus and fire it up. I'm talking to the CloudStack later today, so I'm going to find out whether, how interested they are. I'm actually going to the Citrix CloudStack forum. And then OpenStack, there's some vendors and end users already starting to use bits of um, Netflix OSS um, with OpenStack. So it's starting to get there. There's a, a sub-project called Heat that implements some of the missing features that we need. So we're getting there. This is moving from a collection of open source parts to being more of a platform. We're trying to build an ecosystem around it. And one of the sort of you know, warnings here is this is a very rapidly evolving platform. So we call it a mean time between an idea and making stuff happen is very short. There's a whole lot of. Um, stuff on slideshare.net slash Netflix. I'm highlight a few things here. This one isn't actually at Netflix. It's, the, it's on the Amazon site. But we have a meetup on, for people that are local. July 17th at Netflix, there's a meetup. It's our third meetup. We're going to have vendors and end users demonstrating the things they're doing with Netflix OSS, as well as talking about our new projects. And um, we have some big vendors and names you would have recognized uh, that are doing interesting things. So that's basically it. We're trying to make it easier for everyone to become cloud native, as well as explaining what we mean by cloud native. Um, and that's, that's it. Thanks.